Hey guys, welcome to uh, season two, episode two on my series on the great jazz labels. We're focusing on the late 50s now, uh, Prestige, chapter two. We're going to cover 56 through 59, four years, and it's a prolific amount of music. Bob Weinstock didn't hesitate to record these cats, exploit these cats, and cash in on these cats. Uh, it's that demeanor of Weinstock that keeps them a rung and a notch below Blue Note. And we talked about Blue Note last episode, just how incredible their, their canon is in the 50s, early 60s. And we're going to look now at what some of what Prestige was doing. And there's still some great stuff, but there's a lot more tricks and gimmicks that you have to look out for. Uh, start off with this Coltrane session with Tad Dameron. A nice record. And what we're going to find here is still a lot of stuff that's coming from an earlier era being issued on the LP. And it's kind of a consistent theme here at Prestige. Um, uh, Thelonious Monk, Sonny Rollins, guys like this with big names who go on to other labels. Prestige is going to constantly keep repackaging that stuff. And it's really easy to come home with the same stuff. Great session here, Miles with Lucky Thompson. Uh, this actually goes back to the mid-50s. It's from a couple different sessions. There's nothing we're going to find out about Prestige compared to Blue Note is Prestige is so willing to couple a few different sessions together, even if they're not that cohesive, even if the playing lineups aren't the same. It's Weinstock's just looking for a buck, you know? It's pretty clear. Uh, one of the first true great records on Prestige is Saxophone Colossus of course, by Sonny Rollins, and uh, this is a one-session recording, and it feels cohesive. The band stays the same, the mood, the temper stays the same, and if, if we do half the album now, and, and three months later we do some more with a different rhythm section, it's just not going to feel the same, and that's, this is something that Prestige is kind of guilty of. Uh, they do have some great album covers in this period, All Day Long is a great jam session, Jam Sessions is another thing that Prestige does continuously. They just record guys who showed up that day. Obviously, the legend says a lot of them are just there to get their heroin money because he paid out cash at, on the day. The guys would go off and, and get high. And thank God they recorded because there's still some great stuff here. You know, It just it illustrates how less the art was what mattered at Prestige compared to Blue Note, where there was a lot of rehearsal, where there was a lot of focus on who's the right guys for this session to create the mood that we're looking for. Here's much more just hodgepodge, just humbled together. Uh, Hank Mobley has a couple of records here for Prestige. And uh, he has two on Savoy, two on Prestige, and then 20 some on Blue Note. You know? uh, it's a good record, not as good as Blue Note stuff, but still good stuff. One of my favorite players on Prestige with a lot of records is Gene Ammons. He's the uh, son of Mead Lux Ammons, uh, one of the Boogie Woogie piano stride players from the swing era. And this guy's a soulful player. He blows in a, the turntine, lockjaw Davis kind of mode. Very soulful, very bit of rhythm and blues. You can feel that they've heard what Louis Jordan is doing, so they're crossing over somewhat, but it's still got a lot of jazz uh, feel to it, paint to it. Burrell shows up across the board on labels. He's a pretty prolific recorder. Kenny Burrell, I'm happy for that. I love Kenny Burrell. Um, a guy I love, part of the first Miles Quintet, was Red Garland. He's a lot of records on Prestige. I recommend almost all of them. They're, I do all of them. They're all great. I've never not enjoyed a Red Garland record when I put it on. Uh, he's, a, he's a very rhythmic player. Stays within the melody and, and the chordal changes you know, pretty strictly. So he's not going to be super experimental like an Evans, but he's still got a wonderful swing to him and a real comfort, which you can always kind of count on when you go to a Red Garland record. There's a lot of records with guitar players, guys like Jim Rainey, uh, of course Morrell, we'll get to some more later. Mal Waldron has a lot of records on Prestige slash New Jazz, which we'll cover here on the next little mini episode. Uh, Mal's a very creative, innovative arranger. Uh, he always has creative lineups, a guy definitely worth looking for. Hard to find a lot of his records. Another interesting guy on Prestige is Mose Allison. He's a piano player, he's a singer, 
He's an interesting arranger. He takes his cues from very few places. Like he's, he's kind of hard to pin down, and you're not going to necessarily know what to expect from one Mose Allison record to the next. But still great stuff always. A lot of blowing sessions, three trumpet players, they're blowing, and the stuff gets reissued pretty consistently with different covers. Uh, this was part of a, a quartet of records that Miles, as most of you know, when he signed with Columbia, he made a deal to finish up his contract with Prestige. So he brought the great quintet in, and they recorded these four records in two days, if I recall. And they came out over the course of the next couple of years while he'd already moved to Columbia. But cooking, working, steaming, and relaxing are miles at one of his apex. And Coltrane is in a real developmental phase and really pushing, I mean, miles out of comfort zones at times. The rhythm section is, does a great job of keeping those guys flowing along with the groove. Pretty classic stuff. And some of Prestige's most notable stuff. Uh, Ray Draper has a couple records on Prestige and, and New Jazz, and uh, Tuba. It's not something you really associate with jazz. Until you hear that record, it's a great record. It's fantastic. Gil Mel is another guy. He has a record on Blue Note early in late '55, and he has like four records, I think, three records maybe on Prestige. Uh, and another very interesting arranger. Uh, there's a not as not the consistency to what Prestige is doing as there would be on Blue Note. Blue Note very much feels like a canon of angry young black men. The Gil Mel stuff, obviously, he's a white guy. It's a real different ball of wax at Prestige. Ray Bryant's a great uh, rhythm and blues uh, piano player. He really knows how to get a groove going. I hope some of this stuff's hard to find. You see there's two numbers on there. It's Prestige number 7098, but it's also New Jazz 8227 because they reissued a lot of stuff on both imprints which allows you to come up with the same record again, which again can be kind of annoying. Barbara Lee has a couple cool records on Prestige. Uh, she's a cool, great little singer. Her records are tough to come by, and a couple of the toughest ones for me to find for her records here. One of the most important records on Prestige at this point is Coltrane's first solo record, and he's still developing. He's still growing. Uh, I think this is from two different sessions as well, which again, just that's Prestige how they do. All the way into 1960-61, they're still releasing LPs where side one will be a session from 59, side two will be a session from 57, with a track thrown in from 56. There's not a lot of stuff that was just recorded in one shot, one take. And I do feel it affects a lot of how that feels. Uh, Curtis Fuller, I'm a big fan of him. This is one of my favorite prestige album covers, the train tracks. It just looks great. There's a lot of interesting stuff in here. Art Taylor, the great drummer and photographer and storyteller, had a couple records on Prestige as a leader. Uh, this is Taylor's Whalers. He's also got Taylor's Tenors. Both worth looking for. Great hard bop, straightforward stuff. This is a Thad Jones record. The original, this is a reissue double pack with Oleo. And again, they took two records, repackaged it as one, and that's just kind of how they like to roll. Squeezing pennies and dollars out. Now, after Miles goes to Columbia, Columbia was smart enough to bring Gil Evans along and another white guy and have him rearrange and produce a lot of Miles sessions, which made some very commercial accessible records for white America to buy. Uh, they're not bad by any definition, but it's just a different thing than what Blue Note was doing. This is part of why Blue Note is so special. Yusuf Latif, not one of those records is on New Jazz and on Prestige. Uh, he was a prolific recorder. He made a lot of recordings for Savoy in the late 50s. He goes to Prestige and he makes a whole slew of recordings for Impulse. Uh, I like Yusuf a lot. He's a very expressive player. He definitely explores different sounds, uh, Eastern sounds. Uh, you know, Muslim, of course. Another great Red, Gar Red Garland record. Nice picture of the East River. Sonny Stitt, a guy that's a little underappreciated, I think, in today's jazz circles. He has a lot of great recordings on Roost in the 50s. Uh, he made some early recordings on Prestige in the early 50s, which they released early in the 12-inch era, early in the 7000 series. But by the late 50s, he's back doing some recordings for Prestige, and he's sounding pretty good on some of these records. 
is one of those guys that you're not really sure what you're going to get from a Sunny Stitt record. This is a really good record, really hard to find. Classic album cover with Tommy Flanagan overseas with a bunch of C's, clever stuff. And then at some point here, Prestige launches the new jazz imprint, and they tend to put the more exploratory, uh, interesting, unique stuff on that imprint. And they kept the Prestige 7000 series in the 7100, 7200, so forth, in a different direction. That starts becoming more soul jazz. And some of the artists that really start to help push and develop that sound are guys like Eddie Lockjaw Davis, who has a lot of recordings. He makes stuff with Shirley Scott as well. And he definitely is that soul kind of player. Um, Willis Jackson, his stuff is very much in that same soul jazz dynamic. Uh, a lot of organ stuff. You're going to see some stuff with Shirley Scott here, who has probably 20 records on Prestige before she goes to Impulse. Again, really organ soul jazz based stuff. Pal Singer, a great player you don't hear much about with Charlie Shavers, who I'm a big fan of. Here's a Benny Green record, the trombone player, and this was issued a mere four years earlier, like what, 70, 65 or something like that. And here we are, 71, 60, 100 years later, 100 records later, and they've already repackaged it, all different cover. You know, keep making that money. A lot of outskirts of town. This is a session of just a blowing guy session. You know, a bunch of guys showed up that day. Our farmer, Adrian Suleiman, Buster Cooper, Jerome Richardson, Jimmy Forrest, Pepper Adams, Ray Bryant, Tiny Grimes, Wendell Marshall, Ozzy Johnson, Jerry Valentine. So it's just a huge list of players. And I like a lot of those records, but they certainly do have a bit of a hodgepodge feeling at times. Uh, Bill Jennings was a great rhythm guitar player who made a lot of recordings as a session side guy. There are very few as a leader. This is one of them here, Prestige, at number 7164. And it's a tough record to find. It took me a long time to find that. So all in all, Prestige's legacy is very solid. It's a very important part of the jazz history and the jazz canon. The prolific amount they recorded is partly why they're so important, because there's just so many great artists that did make sessions there. It just, when you measure it up against the Blue Note and even Riverside, the consistency is not there. The mission statement's not there. The mission statement pretty clearly from Bob Weinstock is, how do I make money off these guys? And he didn't mind recording black artists, thankfully, but he's not reputed, he's not reputed to have treated them very well. Uh, he definitely recorded white artists as well. Like I said, there's no clear statement on what Weinstock's looking to do, aside from make a few bucks, which is kind of the American dream and part of the problem, you know, is, is where we are as a society. This was so governed and dictated by money. But uh, I love all the Prestige stuff. They're not as hard to find as Blue Note. They're not as expensive as Blue Note. Especially when you start getting the 7100 and up. That stuff's pretty easy to come by. Original pressings that you ain't going to have to break the bank for. Unlike the old Blue Notes where pretty much anything before Liberty Bottom is going to cost you an arm and a leg. You know. So cheers to Bob Weinstock. They're, it's a great legacy great recordings. If you find the old stuff, buy them. Uh, I do know if you find old prestiges that look unplayable, they'll probably play pretty good. It's pretty amazing what those old war horses can play through. Dings and scratches and marks. You're like, that's not going to sound great. And oftentimes they'll sound just fine. Uh, Prestige is one of the real jewels of the OJC reissue series from the 80s. They were part of a big family under fantasy and they bought out Riverside, they bought out New Jazz, they bought out Contemporary, they bought out Primo Prestige. So a lot of that OJC reissue stuff that came out in the 80s was a lot of the Prestige canon, thankfully. Uh, a lot of the OJC stuff sounds fantastic. It's available much more early than the old pressings, and it's usually very affordable. Although I've seen OJC stuff starting to go for 40, 50, 60 bucks now too, which is insane because all that stuff sold for 3.98, 5.98, even into the 90s. So. Hail to the jazz gods that keep that music alive and keep us pursuing this great American art form that not enough people appreciate and value in this culture. Americans are almost too ashamed to look at their own past. They don't want to recognize this history. They don't want to see the pain that birthed this music. 
So a lot of white America just doesn't even listen to jazz or understand black culture and black music. They don't want to own it because it would face them and force them to recognize some of their own history and some of the past. And it's a shame because we need to face our past to, to avoid repeating it, which is a cliche, but it's very true. And you, there's a rise of nationalism and a rise of fear right now in this country that if we don't see the mistakes we've made before, we will make them again. And these jazz musicians are crying out to me through their horns and their spirits and their souls, saying empathy for others is the key. And empathy is only a product of understanding. It's an ignorance that we become victims to fear, and fear becomes hate. So I plead with you all, try to understand. Try to understand diversity. I moved to rural America, and there's definitely a shift in people's understanding of different groups out here in rural America. I'm living in a small town, Rochester's only 10 minutes away, but just the average person, they're good people. They're not bad, openly racist people, but they've just been programmed to be afraid. All their media, all their TV reminds them to be afraid of different groups, Muslims, you know, Jews, Asians, Russians, Blacks, Mexicans. It's all just kind of this reminder to be afraid of what you don't understand. And we're gonna make sure you don't understand because we're gonna keep you so distracted, we'll never have time to understand. And so some of that's on us. We have to want to understand. We have to want to see this human culture that we're a part of and recognize that, wow, even a few centuries ago, we were awful. And so today we must also still be awful. What can I do to better this world myself and to bring some love and some tolerance and some empathy into this world? Jazz is a vehicle for that. Jazz speaks for the oppressed. Jazz speaks like the Old Testament did for the children of Israel. It's a powerful statement of what freedom will force a people to do. Uh, I'm the Jazz Shepherd. I'm going to do a little mini episode here following up on the new jazz imprint just to kind of th throw some of those at you too. Y'all have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Peace.